Real estate is challenging. It's not meant to be easy. If it was mm -hmm. meant to be easy, everybody would be a real estate millionaire. I agree. It's going to kick you in the teeth, right? And so what is going to get you to continue to get back up other than money? And so when you can find that thing that fulfills you from a personal standpoint and meets your monetary goals, then you'll sustain. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of The Report. Today, we are back in the studio and we got some sunshine out here in San Diego. And I'm excited because we got another Beers and Deals real estate meetup here tonight in downtown San Diego. And I got a special guest who's fresh off the jets <laughs> and fresh out of Arkansas. He does a lot of work with Bigger Pockets. I got my man, Henry Washington. Henry, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me, man. This is a pretty, pretty sweet setup you got, man. This is amazing. Dude, I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you coming all the way out. We're excited to have you at the fucking meetup tonight. And uh, dude, I got to ask you, I know you do a lot of stuff with Bigger Pockets. Uh, that's kind of how I first found out about you. But um, how did you get involved with Bigger Pockets, man? Oh, man, that is a, a little bit of luck, a little bit of God, and a little bit of just being good to people. So I, uh, I went to the Bigger Pockets conference, their first like real conference. They had like a, like a, a semi one a year before that, but then they did their first one officially in Nashville. Mm. and that's a great place for a conference by the way yeah that was my first time going to nashville yeah. that place is pretty cool but, we, we uh, were just out there two weeks ago the whole team for oh a, i did i saw that Con. yeah i saw that and dude third time going to that conference downtown nashville it's a yeah. great place for a conference yeah man it's a cool place so i screwed up when i went to the bigger pockets conference why i got there a day early so I, okay. I, I my scheduling just wasn't right i got there a day before it started it wasn't planned. Mm. Uh, and I happened to be standing in line to get coffee one morning. And there was this really, really tall guy in front of me with a beard. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Sam, that's Brandon Turner, right? And yeah. so I just introduced myself and started talking to him. And at some point during the conference, we chit-chatted about um, uh, my story. And at that point, I was only my sec. It was like I had been doing it for about a year, a little over a year. I had about 30 some odd rental properties. Mm -hmm. And I started with nothing. I had like a thousand dollars to my name when I got started. And so I was telling him the story and he's like, dude, this is amazing. And I had no idea that it was like, I had done a lot. Like I just thought I was doing what everybody else was doing. Right. I was coming to this BP bigger pockets conference to learn. And he was like, man, you should come on the podcast sometime. And I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. Like he's not going to call me. And then, um, he did mm -hmm. <laughs> and asked me to be on the show. And it was funny. I, I had a, I have a, I still have it on my phone. She's got my phone. Mm -hmm. But I've got a vision board on my phone, and one of the tiles on my vision board was the Bigger Pockets uh, podcast tile because I was like, I wanted to be really? a guest on the show. <clears throat> this is before you even this went to the conference. This is before I even went show. to the conference. Okay. And so screw up, get there a day early, meet Brandon, telling my story. That gets me on the on the on the conference. But I I went out of my way at that conference to do a few things. One, I wanted to be of value to as many people as I could find. I didn't go to that conference to get anything. Mm. I went to that conference to find as many people who I could add value to because that's how the world works. If you give then you get yeah and so i think people network the wrong way people always network looking to see what can i get out of an experience dude 100 percent, man i when, just want to go and, and give when i host these these meetups uh i would say 95 percent of the folks that come out are, are very giving um but you know every now and then we get we get those folks that there's those like realtors that come through with a stack of business cards and they're just like hey nice to meet you here's my business card if you ever need to buy a house hey nice to meet you here's my business card if you want to buy a house here's my business card if you want to do a home loan and I'm like, dude, that is the wrong that way. That is the to wrong network. way. Yeah, absolutely. But anyways, so uh, back to back to the conference. Yeah. So um, somebody at that conference told me Jay Scott was looking to buy property or multifamily in Northwest Arkansas, and so I was like, well, I'll go connect with him because this is where I do business. And so I just went and I was like, I made it a mission to like get in front of him, figure out what he's looking for, and then work really hard to find him something and just bring him a deal. Like I didn't want anything. I just was like, how do I help people? And so. I don't know. I think just being of service to people, people remember people who were trying to be of service to them and didn't really want anything in return. And so fast forward when Brandon retires, the producer of the podcast called me. I also think my podcast up until that point was uh -huh. like the second most downloaded episode. Really? The Bigger Pockets podcast or something like that <laughs> as a guest. And so they reached out to me and said, hey, would you guest host a few episodes until we figure out what we're going to do? And I was like, yeah, man, say less. And that turned into me now just working with them consistently. Dude, I love that. And you're also a co-host on On The Market. Um, what's that podcast all about? On The Market is geared towards the more, uh, I don't want to say seasoned investor, but somebody who's done a few deals, right? And so the goal of that podcast is to take a look at what's going on in the economy, what's going on in the real estate landscape, 
and then we talk about how that is or isn't affecting actual investors. It's meant to kind of give a more real time, real world feel of it's, it's scary out here right now for a lot of people, it especially is. if they're new. They're like, should I buy right now? Should I not buy right now? The media's, you know, it's it's scare tactics, right? It's it's they want to get you to read their article, and so they they put scary headlines, and so we kind of break all that stuff down and talk about what's what's the real story here, and how's this really truly affecting actual boots on the ground investors. I love that you guys do that because I mean, you know, looking back, I feel like every single year there's some sort of fear in the marketplace. You know, if you look at, you know, 2018, 2019, people were like, man, prices have never been this high. We're due for another recession. <laughs> yeah. It's coming. Yeah. And then 2020, it was like, oh, the whole world's coming down to an end, like COVID and lockdown and like everyone's just like fearful. Uh, and then 2021, it was like, well, there was this, the world shut down and, and there was not a big recession. They just printed a bunch of money. Interest rates were all time low. And there was so much demand. Yep. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, inflation, the Fed's yeah. increasing <laughs> rates, like we're going to another big recession. And so, uh, and there's been a lot of fear and volatility in the last couple of years. So, yep. you know, I feel like every single year there's bad news out there. And that's why I think it's important to uh, get around folks like like you and myself and, and listen to uh, folks that are actually out there taking action. Because unfortunately, I think a lot of those uh, fear mongers out there that are on the news, uh, those aren't the same people that are actually buying real estate. Yeah, I mean, that's what makes shows like this and shows like On the Market so powerful. Before this was available to people, and I mean, like, you know, don't take this anything the wrong way, but like there's major news media outlets and that's where everybody got all their information. You only got the real story to what was actually affecting boots on the ground investors if you knew somebody in your market who was like, hey, man, look, don't worry about that. This is what we're doing. This is how we're battling those things, right? And now you can actually get that information through media outlets like yours and, and things like on the market where people who would have had to go build a relationship with somebody, you know, the, the mm -hmm. old guy, you know, in, in your market, that's like, oh, no, we're still doing heal deals. Here's how we're doing yeah. it. Now, everybody can kind of get that information if you're if you're tapped into the right sources. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I, I think, you know, in any market cycle, you can you can buy. You just have to adjust your your investment strategy a little bit. Like, for example, I think you know, in 15, 16, 17, 18, when, when the market was hot, you know, you could get away with even buying turnkey properties and just letting time and inflation and appreciation do its thing. Uh, and then the last two years, I, I'd say, you know, uh, some people, you know, call it what you want to call it, but we've been in a softening environment, high interest rate environment. And, um, you know, I felt like, hey, the market's going to continue to soften before it improves. And because we don't have that organic appreciation right now, I think it's more important to buy at a discount and to buy assets uh, to where you can add tremendous value because it gives you a cushion and a buffer for air should you miss a little bit on your assumptions or should the market continue to soften. But you buy those two things, you can still buy. And quite frankly, to buy good assets in good locations in the high interest rate environment, it's been easier because there's a lot less competition out there. 100%. You know? man. It is, I've been telling people, I've been trying to scream it from the rooftop. So like, this is probably the best time there has been in my lifetime to buy real estate because I think there's a lot of assumptions, right? People are assuming or they feel it's, it's more of a feeling. People feel interest rates are high, right? Because that's what everybody's telling, but they're not that high, right? My parents paid like 12, 13% interest yeah, when they bought a house, yeah. right? Like they're, if you look at the scale of interest rates over time, they're pretty normal right now. They're pretty average. Pre COVID, we were getting 6% interest rates for rental properties, right? It's not that much above that right now. Uh, but people feel that it's high. And so they're not in the game, which limits the competition. And then the other thing people feel is they feel like prices are high. And I get that they, they are high if you compare them to last year. But if you fast forward three or four years, if rates come down, these prices are just going to go up. So we're actually in a market where you can buy at a discount with limited competition at a lower price. And I don't think that that's ever been a thing before. I totally agree with you. And, and, you know, if, if you look at the, the macroeconomics of real estate, I mean, if, if you, I would have told you two years ago, uh, you probably would have been shocked. Like, hey, we're going to double interest rates. And for the most part, in most major markets around the country, real estate prices are going to be relatively untouched over a two-year span. I would have thought you were crazy, right? right? That's a huge <laughs> lever. Yeah. And uh, I think it's really just a testament to the supply-demand fundamentals that we're actually, you know, yeah. in right now. I mean, if you think about it, um, I've seen multiple articles come out to where we're, you know, anywhere from four to five million housing units short of where the demand needs to be uh, from a macro perspective. 
Um, and if you look at the baby boomers, they're, they're living a little bit longer. They're not selling their homes and re- moving out into retirement uh, homes as early as they, they once were. And then from a demand standpoint, you got the millennials that are buying their first homes or starting families. And then you get the Gen Zs behind, behind them. They're moving out of their parents' house for the first time. They're looking for apartments to rent. And so, uh, and then from a supply standpoint, because of the high interest rate environment that we've been in, because of COVID, there's been less new builds and new new housing starts. And so that's not helping the uh, supply demand fundamentals. And so I think because those fundamentals are so strong, we can see this high interest rate environment. It's, you know, leaving the the housing prices relatively untouched. Yeah, absolutely. The, the supply and demand, like it's, real estate is super local. And I think, People really have to figure out a way to understand their local market, um, either that whether that's through relationships, whether that's through their own research. But like in my market, we still have, I think we're like 3,000 homes short of what we would need to satisfy the demand in my local market, right? And so what that tells me is if I can buy a good property at a good price, and I can, if I'm gonna flip it, I know I can sell it as long as I make that product decent. It's not like 2020 where you could, 2021, where you could put lipstick on a pig and yeah. sell anything, right? But if you renovate a property decently and stick it on the market at a fair price, it's gonna sell, mm. right? And now you can buy those properties at a discount because if you think about it, if pe- if somebody's selling a home right now, there's a, more, there's a higher likelihood that they need to sell that home versus that they want to, because it's not the best time to sell. Right. Right. Uh, in terms of getting the, the greatest return on your uh, on that on that piece of property. And so that means you can go negotiate great terms and great pricing for yourself, mm-hmm. get a great deal. And you can monetize that property a little easier now on the sale, on the rent, a little more difficult in that eight mm-hmm. and a half, nine percent interest rate. But yeah. uh, there's there's way more benefits to real estate than just cash flow. Dude, I agree with you, man. And and I think to your point, a lot of the sellers out there that are selling, it's like, they're selling because they have to. Either they're moving yeah. or they need to get out of a project. And so, like I said, man, I think there's opportunities right now uh, to go out and, and, and get some stuff at a discount. We're in election year. There's talk of, you know, the Fed doing some cuts this year. I think a lot of that might be in the back half of this year. Um, I think the <clears throat> most latest inflation report that came out a little bit higher than anticipated. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think we're going to see any rate cuts in the, in the next four to six yeah, months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Def- <laughs> definitely not looking like they were. They people, don't have any reason to cut rates right now. People were pricing it in. Yeah. And so we'll see. But uh, I think for the buyers out there, uh, you know, people that listen to this podcast right now, I think, you know, the opportunity is now uh, to go in and lock up uh, at a discount where there's not a lot of competition because I'll tell you what, as soon as those rates start coming down, and then the sentiment in the news and the marketplace changes, well, all of a sudden you're gonna have a lot of offers on these properties again. It's gonna be a lot more competitive. So yep. we'll see. I'm yeah. speculating, I'm willing to be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but dude, uh just give us a uh give me an idea. Like what is what does your portfolio look like today? What what kind of um, real estate are are you buying today? Hey guys, real quick, the only way the show grows, the only way we continue to bring on bigger and better guests is if you guys rate, review, and share the show. So if you could take two seconds or the click of the thumb to review on Apple or Spotify, it will mean the world to me. But more importantly, we'll be able to reach more entrepreneurs and more real estate investors and help them build wealth through this podcast. Now back to the show. One of the things that I enjoy, I tell people when they're going to pick a strategy is like, there's a million ways to make a million dollars in real estate, right? So if you're going to pick a strategy, pick one that a will meet your monetary goals, right? So you have to understand what financial goals you're trying to hit when you get into investing. But also you need to find a strategy that, you know, I call it gives you the warm fuzzies, right? That you're doing beyond for reasons beyond just money, right? When you marry those two things, then I think you're gonna stick it out through the difficult parts because real estate's challenging. It's not meant to be easy. If it was mm-hmm. meant to be easy, everybody'd be a real estate millionaire. I agree. It's going to kick you in the teeth, right? And so what is gonna get you to continue to get back up other than money. And so when you can find that thing that fulfills you from a personal standpoint and meets your monetary goals, then you'll sustain. Cause the only thing that sets a successful investor apart from someone who hasn't found success or wasn't successful is just that they quit, right? We know real estate works. It's been working for decades and decades. If you continue to do the things in this space, you will build wealth eventually. And so I choose single and small multifamily real estate because of the people aspect of it. Like I can do things for people that I can't do in large scale multifamily, right? Like I can, like I had a, a a property recently, I bought a four unit and we had a lady in there who had lived there for over 20 years. And so I took as long as humanly possible as I could to let her stay there. She was only paying $400 a month rent. We didn't raise a rent. 
right? We let her stay there. We renovated everything else around her before we could get to her unit, right? And then we gave her, I think it was 60 plus days to be able to look for and find another place to live. Like mm. financially, that wasn't the best business decision. Yeah. But it was the best people decision. Mm -hmm. It was the right thing to do for that person. Dude, I love that you said that, man. Um, I, I get this question all the time. People are like, hey, like, uh, do you ever buy small apartment buildings to operate them as a boutique hotel? And I'm like, I don't. And uh, two reasons, like one, you know, without the hotel zoning, no matter how much you increase that NOI, appraiser is still going to value that that property based in the comp set of other multifamily properties in the area. But number two, which is, I think is the most important reason that piggybacks off your, what you just said here is like, I don't like kicking people out. It's like not really a feel good aspect uh, in, do, in doing that. So to go buy a 10 unit apartment building and, and kick out 10 families and then operate it as a, as a hotel. That doesn't make you feel doesn't, good. Doesn't so feel I love good. that you yeah. said that, man. Yeah, man. This is a, this is a real estate is a people business. It's not a real estate business. It's a people business that transaction real estate. It is. And if you can do this business in a way that uplifts people, I think you can be very successful. You know, one of our mottos is we don't always make the best business decision, but we always try to make the best people decision. And if that people decision costs us money, we're okay with that. Because these are, you know, in, in the single small multifamily space, you're dealing with these are people's homes. Sometimes it's the only wealth that they've been able to build, right? And so I never want to walk into someone's home and see that exchange as a deal I need to close. Like, I want to walk in that home and see this as an exchange. Like, you need help or else you wouldn't be talking to me, right? I have to buy at a discount. So there's a reason you're selling at a discount. And that reason typically you think is that you need to sell your home to get money to take care of whatever that problem is. And so sometimes we'll walk into somebody's home and we can help them without buying their house. And if that's what we need to do, then we're going to do that. I love that. How, how are you guys finding the majority of your deals? Uh, uh, most all the traditional ways right now, mostly direct mail marketing. It seems it's what's, it's what's working best for us. You know, it always just a little shifts. It was cold calling for a while, but that's not working as well. And so. We're, we're back doing a lot of direct mail that's sourcing a lot of our deals. Um, but we've tried, we've tried a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. I do done radio ads and we've done, uh, radio bill, ads. billboards. Yeah. Radio's worked and well. Billboards. Yeah. Wow. Radio's okay. worked well. Billboards didn't, I wouldn't say we've tested billboards long enough to know if it's beneficial or not, but radio ads has been. G give me beneficial. an example of, of like what we, what you would say in a radio ad. Yeah. So uh, the, my radio ad, it, same thing that you would see on like a postcard or, or, or a piece of mail. It says, uh, it, you know, my name is Henry. We buy houses here in Northwest Arkansas. So it's all local radio station, right? We buy houses here in Northwest Arkansas. We'll buy anything regardless of the condition. We can close fast as quickly as you need to. You can have cash in as little as seven to 14 days if that's, if that's what you're looking for. So we just kind of hit the points that the pain points that someone who would need to sell at a discount would, would look for. I read the ad myself just because I want them to, it's, it's more of like building trust than having yeah. somebody at the radio read the for ad sure. for your business. And then with radio, it's, it's too, it's just, they got to hear it over and over and over again. The more they hear it, the more it builds trust. So it's not a fast strategy, but it's been a lucrative one. Yeah. Yeah. And I can imagine, I mean, yeah, I don't listen to the radio, but for yeah. some of these, uh, I'm also in small town <laughs> America, right? right. So, small yeah. town America, but also for the, the demographic that, that are maybe selling these, these homes where they're like, Hey, they're, they're, they they need some help. Maybe those folks are listening to the radio, so yep. it kind of makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, dude, I'm I'm curious. Uh, you you said your your episode Bigger Pockets was one of the most downloaded ones. I'm curious, like going back a little bit. How did you get your start in in real estate investing? Oh man, that I know I know people must resonate with with with, with your journey. Uh, but I'm curious, how did you get your start, man? Yeah. So I bought my first property 90 days after having a panic attack. So I had a panic attack because. Uh, my wife, Jessica, and I got married fairly quickly. And shout, shout out to Jessica, by the way. She's out here uh, watching the podcast as we speak. Yep. Yeah. We got married 90 uh, or one year to the day that we met. So we met 365 days later, we got married. Dude, I love that. And um, that's a fast transition, right? Yeah. And uh, I wasn't financially responsible before I'd gotten into real estate. I, I spent more than I made and as a single male, I was fine living like that, but I got married and realized that that wasn't okay for now. Somebody else was having to bear the weight of my poor financial decisions. And, um, we tried to buy a house together and the bank, uh, the lender called me and said, if you want your wife to be able to buy a house, you can't be on the loan. Your credits, you know, it's hurting her opportunity to be able to be a homeowner. So that was a big shot in the gut. 
Uh, and it was like that wake up call to realize like, I've got to do something different financially. And then, um, I had a panic attack the night after we were having a conversation about our, our future and what we were going to do in terms of kids and where we were going to live and, you know, what our dream house looked like. And I just was realizing like, I can't afford anything that she wants and that I want for us. And so freaked out at three in the morning and started Googling how to make extra money. That led me to articles about real estate, saw normal people owned real estate, bought real estate. And so I made a decision at three in the morning that I was going to figure out how to buy real estate. I had none of the things that would make you think that it was a smart decision to think that I had a thousand dollars to my name in savings and I had bad credit, but for some reason, like the idea of buying real estate resonated with me. And so I just decided I was going to figure it out and, uh, woke up the next morning and told her we were going to be real estate investors. And she was like, yeah, okay, whatever. That's cool. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, 90 days later, after a lot of research and a lot of, you know, putting ourselves in intentional positions around other people, we were fortunate enough to, to find our first deal and changed our lives. So, uh, going back with, with the bank telling, uh, Jessica, Hey, you know, you guys can buy this house, but, but Henry's not going to be on the loan. Did you guys end up buying that? Or you, you decided, Hey, we're going to go buy an investment. Yeah, we bought instead. it. Oh, we you bought well, it. Okay. Sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize. She bought it. She bought it. Okay. She allowed me okay. to live there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then 90 days later, you went and closed on the first investment property. Yeah. Gotcha. And, yeah. and what was that what first deal for you? It was a single family home. Uh, Fix and flip or? No, we kept it as a rental. One of the things that I, I just believe in is tell everybody what you're doing. Put it, put it out into the universe, man. And the universe will give you the things that go with that thing. So I Dude, started. Dude, I love doing that. Yeah. And it's like, it's a way to keep yourself accountable. Because if I, if I put something out on social media, I tell everyone, hey, I'm going to do this then I better fucking do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like no yeah. better motivator. I, yeah. I don't understand when people try to keep secrets. I'm like, dude, if you really want to do something, put it out there for the universe. And man. Yeah. But you know, you'll, you'll start to receive the things that come with that when you put it out there. And so I, uh, I did, I started telling people I was an investor. I had no idea how to buy a house, but I was telling people I was a real mm. estate investor just cause that's what I wanted to be. And uh, a buddy of mine heard that I was buying houses and he was in a tough spot with his house and called me and said, Hey, I got to sell my house. I got to sell in 30 days because I need the money to go buy this other property for my church. And as long as you can buy it in 30 days, I'll sell it to you at a huge discount. So he sold it to me for 115. It was worth 165. It was in good shape. I mean, I knew I'd been there. I knew it was a great house. And, uh, and so he was like, you know, as long as you can buy it in 30 days, I'll sell it to you for that. Can you buy it in 30 days? And I was like, yep. I love that. Yep. I have no idea how, but yep. And how'd you finance that one? <laughs> After, uh, I put it under contract, which I didn't know how to do. I literally had to go back to my desk and Google how to buy a house without a real estate agent. <laughs> and it told me to like fill out a contract. And so I downloaded some contract and we filled it out. And then I took that contract that same day to the bank closest to my office because I just figured I needed money and banks have money. So I walked into a bank with the contract and asked them if someone could help me get financing for this real estate piece of property. And I just happened to be talking to the commercial lender in the, in the lobby. And he was like, well, come into my office. And he looked at it and he was like, man, this is a really good deal. Mm. We would love to be able to finance this for you. He was like, you're going to need a 15% down payment. It's about 20 grand. Do you have 20 grand? And I was like, yep. Damn. <laughs> I did not have 20 grand. Yeah. But uh, <sighs> I was going to figure out how to get it. I like that. And uh, you got to fake it till you make it. Yeah. So I ended up brainstorming with a now business partner, but then was just another investor on like how I can find this money to buy this house. And he told me about 401k loans. I didn't know that was a thing. So mm -hmm. I ended up borrowing the money from Jessica's 401k. Oh man. For us to buy that first property. And, uh, it changed, changed my life. I love that. Dude. It's always assuring. Like if the lender, uh, likes the deal, I mean, especially this being your first deal, like, you know, everything's scary the first time. I mean, I remember, I remember my first deal. I was like, Oh, you read all the books and listen to podcasts and hypothetically it's supposed to work, but you don't really know it's going to work until you do it. And then you got friends, family telling you like, what the hell are you doing? You're crazy. Like you're going to lose all your money. What are you thinking? And they tell you, they, they, they're quick to outline all the risks, yep. but you know, work with a lender and it's almost like a second line of underwriting. And so, and the lender is like, they understand the market and they're like, Hey, this is actually a really good deal. We want to lend on it. Gives you a little bit of like warm and fuzzies, you know? Yeah, man. It, it, it definitely was that reassurance, but you can, you can figure this business out, right? I think too many people yeah. want to go have all the steps laid out before they start and take the first step. Sometimes you just got to jump off the cliff and figure out how to open the parachute on the way down. Dude, I agree, man. The most successful people in, in life, they, they start and then they figure out how they, they don't ask how to start, you know? So I think it's obviously important to 
uh, go out and educate yourself, you know, get some baseline fundamentals, get in the right support groups. But at a certain point, it's like, you got to start taking action, you know? And so you'll go through phases. I mean, I've gone through phases where I was reading a lot of books, but then I've gone through phases to where I'm, I'm taking so much action that I don't even have time to read. Yeah, right, right, you know? I'm, right. learning, I'm learning from my own experience. Yeah. And so um, I think both are equally important, but to your point, I, I think we learn by doing, you know, and getting around the right, the right groups and that sort of thing. And so now you're, you're buying, I guess I'm curious your investment strategy now, is it a lot of buying stuff at a discount, renovating, and then refining and keeping it? Or are you flipping some of this stuff too? Yeah, so uh, we have about a portfolio of about 120 some odd uh, rental properties. I love that. So buying holds my main strategy. If I have to pick one, that's what I'd tell people I do. We flip 10 to 15 houses a year. We've been keeping a lot more of them now just because, you know, you take what the defense gives you. And right now I can get really good discounts on properties and I need cost segregation more than I need two, $300 a month cash flow. So we have been um, keeping them in order to help with the tax savings, but you also got to make money, right? Yeah. And with real estate, buy and hold, it's buy and hold. There's a long-term aspect in there. That's the end part is time, right? Yeah. And so they don't just make you money, oodles of money right away. It's time to build equity with those, with those properties. And so you got to keep the lights on. So we flip houses in order to bring in income and keep 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 things going. Uh, so yeah, 10 to 15 flips a year, but right now trying to buy as many properties and hold as many properties as I can because the environment is so great for doing mm. it. How, how do you guys determine uh, if you're gonna flip or you're gonna you're gonna refi and hold a property? I don't know, man, I figure it out after I buy it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I buy as, you know, I, I buy anything that's a good deal. If it's a good deal, I can monetize it. Okay. Right, and so nine times out of 10, if I buy a single family home, I'm probably going to flip it. Okay. But, you know, like the, in this last situation, the last two single family homes I bought were brand new construction. I'm going to keep those. I don't want to like give that deferred maintenance to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to keep those because of the benefit I get of the deferred maintenance. But if I buy a single family, I'm probably going to renovate it and sell it. And if I buy a multi, I'm probably going to renovate it and keep it. Mm. It's just typically how I'm making the decision in general. Are you buying mostly stuff in your local market or are you going out of state? Uh, mostly in my local market, a little bit out of state, like an hour or so out of, outside of town. We've, we've started to buy just because it's more of a cash flow market. Not great for flips in that market, but great for buy and holds. But uh, typically it's an hour, an hour radius. Yeah. Give me an idea of like, because uh, I have some multifamily stuff in uh, like Cincinnati, uh, some of these areas where you can get price per door base a little bit cheaper. Uh, give me an idea like, you know, C-class uh, maybe blue collar stuff, yep. small multifamily in your market. Uh, what's the price per door? What do they sell for? And, and and what's like a one and two bedroom typically rent for? So in my market, distressed property price per door. If I can get something within my market, like my my general Northwest Arkansas population, if I can get it for about 100000 a door or a little bit less, that's typically pretty good. If I'm going to go an hour away where I was talking about, um, they're 75 k a door. And then adding value to those uh, and then selling them at a higher price point. So, I mean, people are buying stuff in my, in my market renovated at, you know, 150 to 200,000 a door. So I'm trying to get it at so about So that multifamily you buy in your market for 100 a door, you can put 30 a door in and it'd be worth 150, 160 a door. And, Absolutely. And what is, what is one of those units rent for? A one bedroom and a two bedroom apartment? One bedroom, I'd say 1,000 now, 1,000 yeah. to 1,100. Wow. Two bedroom, 12 to... 13 or 14, three, you can get 15 to 18, depending on where it is mm. and what, and, and if it has a backyard. Yeah. It's crazy. Cause, uh, my first, my first, very first deal was 11 unit apartment building in Cincinnati. I still own this property today, but I remember the, the one bedrooms were renting for like 400, mm -hmm. the two bedrooms were renting for like maybe like 550. Yeah. Rental yeah. Rental. But I'm like, even in, in, in markets like Cincinnati, like the inflation and the rent growth, like it, it happens pretty quick. Cause now. Those those ones that were renting for four are like renting for like seven seven hundred, and then twos are renting for almost a thousand now. Uh, the one bedroom in our at our house hack. What would we, what would we rent it for when we first bought it? Seven hundred, uh -huh. and what they just rent it for now? Twelve. Yeah. Damn. So almost this, double. Was, this is a house hack we lived in. Yeah. Yeah. So seven hundred when we first bought it, and it's renting one bed. It's a little one bedroom house just by itself, like a mother in law suite, mm. granny flat. Yeah. Eleven hundred. It's crazy. I mean, the the rents go up, and uh, it actually. Yeah, I saw. I always I always look at CoStar data, and uh, you know, Phoenix led the the nation for many years in terms of like rent growth. But Phoenix is kind of topping off now, 
and we're seeing the Midwest, a lot of these Midwest markets yeah. kind of lead the nation in rent growth right now, which is which I found pretty interesting. Yeah, man. There's a lot of, I'm seeing a lot of uh, kind of the, the suburban towns or the towns like an hour and a half outside of the major metros in the mm -hmm. Midwest are really doing well. So, you know, that hour or two hours outside of the Nashvilles and, and places like that are really booming. No, I love that. By the way, man, rocking the black on black. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm rocking black on black that as is well, my, man. That like is a, my wardrobe. Like like a funeral, bro. Yeah. yeah, that's right. <laughs> like, yeah this guy's ready. That is my wardrobe. Ready yes. for the beers and deals meetup tonight, man. Let's do I it. I like it. So I got to ask you, man. So working with Bigger Pockets, you know, um, you know, all these folks out there. Um, I know there's a lot of folks that are involved with with BP. What what is that like? Are you are you guys doing a lot of live events? Are you guys doing in person stuff, or is it all virtual stuff for the most part? They do a lot of virtual throughout the year. They do the one live event, uh, the conference yearly. But work for them has been has been really good, man. I learned a lot of my information from Bigger Pockets when I first got started. So being able to, you know, be a part of that platform now is is super cool. We just got back from. Uh, an event where they flew all the hosts out in order to uh, kind of do, you know, like podcast training and we go over all the metrics and see what shows are doing well. So they're, they're really trying to, you know, make sure that their shows are improving and provide good, valuable information for investors as they try to get on this journey. And, and so that builds a lot of trust with the audience. And, you know, I get to be, I get to benefit from that trust by being, yeah. being a part of the community. Yeah, I like that. Are they pretty cool with, um, I know like Brandon Turner and I've actually never met Brandon in person, but, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to at some point, but so I know when he was on, he was the host of the bigger pockets podcast. Yeah. Now he's got his own podcast. Are they cool with you? Like being involved with BP, but then also kind of building your own brand on the side. Yeah. Did they encourage yeah, that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't get any pushback from them on, on really anything I'm doing. Obviously, you know, if you're under contract with them for some point, you have to represent represent them in the way that they want to be represented, but they're pretty open to, you know, me doing my own thing. I think they have trust in us just as we have trust in them to take yeah. care of our image. You, yeah. you mentioned contracts. So they actually, do they actually negotiate some sort of like uh payment and, and pay scale for like you to jump on and do a lot of hosting and stuff like that? I mean, yeah. I mean, it's just like, it's just like anything else. If anybody else wanted your time, right. Then you, you can, you know, you can charge for your time if you choose to, or so you can have a, you can have a, you know, there's obviously there's needs to be a contract in place to make sure that, you know, you don't, you represent them in the way that they want yeah. you to be represented. Who, yeah. who would you say out of it's all like, the... kind of like a TV deal, right? If yeah. you got a TV deal, you get yeah. a contract per episode kind of thing. Yeah, similar. I like that. Yeah. That's big stuff right there. Who who would say is uh, your, who would you say is your favorite person within like the BP kind of group? Oh, you're you're going to make me with? pick people. Yeah. Oh, I'm man. Curious. I'm curious. Hot seat. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my favorite right now is my on the market cast like okay. they did just such a good job casting that show like we feel like a family like mm. we all chit chat with each other outside of the show and we hang out we'll fly across the country and hang out with each other I love that. so Who, who's on that, that uh james dannard kathy fetke uh and myself and then dave myers the host okay and so like just we feel like a family every time we hang out it's super fun i'm gonna go to la and hang out with kathy like next month are you? Yeah. I love that, dude. Yeah. I'll have to check out the show. I haven't heard it before, but uh, I've heard of it, but yeah. uh, I'll have to take a listen, man. Yeah, please do. I'm always looking for new podcasts and uh, new content to uh, to listen to. So uh, tell me, man, what, what are you working on this year, man? What, what, do you, what kind of projects do you have going on in 2024 that you're most excited about? Yeah, man. Right now, we're, I'm working towards doubling my portfolio just because it's such a great time to buy. You know, we talked a little bit about that, but I'm also growing my mentorship program and helping people kind of break into the real estate space and start to build wealth and started that program maybe two years ago and it's it's grown every year and dude man i get more excited when my students are doing deals and when i find one man yeah I, just, it, I love that it makes me feel good man what, what do you guys do in your community it's more focused on teaching people the acquisition process so if i can teach i, I tell my students if I, if I don't teach you anything other than how to be really really good at finding good deals you have a way to make money for the rest of your life because he who controls the deals makes the money, right? And so um, it's very, very heavily focused on acquisitions and then underwriting, figuring out ways to uh, get deals financed. I tell people, I want you to be a fundamentally sound real estate investor, which means you need to know all the ways you can underwrite a deal. And then you piece together the financing for that deal in the way where that financing makes the most sense for the deal and makes the most sense for your financial situation, mm. right? If you don't have 20%, you don't need to be using a conventional loan, but that's all people know sometimes. And so they're out here trying to buy deals and figure out how to how to get this down payment and they can't do it. 
you know, and, and, and same thing, like with creative financing, a lot of people only understand creative financing. And so they're trying to hammer every deal they find mm -hmm. with some sort of creative financing, but that deal may not make sense for creative financing. An owner finance deal sounds great until you need a hundred thousand dollars to renovate that property. Owner's not going to give you a hundred grand to renovate it, right? You got to go find that money. So it may not be the best financial structure for that deal. So I teach people you know, all the ways you can underwrite a deal and then you can piece together the financing that makes the most sense for the deal and what your financial situation looks like. Yeah. I always talk about that, man. I'm like, I think the dumb, one of the dumbest ways to buy any piece of real estate is to save up for 20, 25% down and buy, buy a property that, you know, there's no room to add any value. And now your 25% is, is trapped in that property for a long time. And to your point, I think whenever we're analyzing any deal, it's like, it's important to remember, okay, like what, what is the business plan here? And what is the ideal type of debt that, that you need to go after in order to take down this, this particular deal? If it's, you know, uh, more of a stable deal that's cash flow and not a ton of value to be added, well, you're probably going to look at some more permanent debt options. But if, like you said, if it's a steeper value add, there's a ton of improvement costs that you need to put in, whether it's through renovation package uh, or any of these other value add uh, levers that you can pull, well, maybe it makes sense to go in and do a bridge yep. loan, you know? Absolutely. But, you know, I think that's cool that, that you guys are teaching that. Do you guys, <clears throat> you guys have a lot of different lenders that you guys work with that, that you also share with your group? Yeah. Yeah. So I've got some private lenders that I use that I'll share with my group and my community. My goal is I want to help you get there a little faster. And so if I can share my resources to help you get there until you have your own, then we're going to do that. But the goal is I want you to be able to build your own network of lenders, your own network of deal flow so that you're self-sustaining. But yeah, we'll share our resources to help you until you have your own. Yeah. I love that. Your biggest partner in a real estate deal is always your lender. For me, I prefer using someone I know, like, and trust, whether you're looking for commercial loans, residential loans, bridge loans, DSCR loans, no debt to income ratio, no tax returns. My guy, Chris Groves, has got you. As seen on episode 77 and episode 142, Chris is a good friend of mine and is doing a special offer for podcast listeners, $2,500 off of your closing costs and or appraisal fees. Visit grovescapital.com slash Rich Summers to book a free call. Again, it's grovescapital.com dot com slash rich summers the book a free call now back to the show dude i want to talk a little bit about content because you know you obviously you do a lot of stuff with podcasting and bp but you do a lot of stuff with your your personal content social media how has that kind of changed the way that that you do business and in real estate deals just just the content side yeah it, it took me probably longer than than i needed than it should have to hire somebody full-time on the content side but that's been a game changer in my business just because you know, eyeballs is the new capital, right? It's yep. like the new oil. Mm. Um, if you've got eyeballs, then you've got a way to make money and you've got a way to impact people and you've got a way to monetize yourself and your brand. And really the the best way to do that is it's just pure consistency. These algorithms change all the time and it's hard to stay on top of what, what you need to be doing on a daily basis in order to stay on top of the algorithm. So we just fight that by being just relentlessly consistent and putting out content. And so, uh, my first hire in my business, like my first official salaried person was a content manager. Um, and that was two years ago, I think. And it's been, it's been great. Just the growth in my social media has been good then, uh, has, has changed everything, but you know, it's, it's, it's opened a lot of doors that mm. I didn't expect. And it's allowed me to be able to impact people in a greater way. And that's really the whole point of why I started. My Instagram is because after I did my first deal, like I said, I had a panic attack and then 90 days later bought my first house. Like I just felt like all those doors open because I'm supposed to show other people that they can change their lives through this too. And so just having a consistent social media channel has allowed me to be able to kind of live out that mission. Dude, I love that. I always say, man, like <clears throat> as an entrepreneur, a real estate investor in today's age, it's like we got technology out there. Um, AI is one example. Social media is another example. And so, you know, for the entrepreneurs and the real estate investors out there that are not utilizing this technology, it's hard to compete with other folks out there that are, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, social media, for example, it's, it's free to post. Uh, you don't need a content manager. It's free to post. And, uh, you know, by doing it, it makes a lot of things a lot easier. You yeah. know, it's not just access to raising capital or uh, access to good quality deals, but you know, it's being able to attract good team members that want to come work with you. They want to be in your ecosystem. Um, people that just want to be in your network and, and help in any way you can. I mean, I get people all the time that reach out. They want to connect me to other folks. But, you know, even just buying deals like through sources that you would have even not thought was possible. Yes. Like we bought our, mo our most recent boutique hotel direct from a lender, like a, a relationship that we have with a bridge lender, you know, and, you know, all this stuff uh, out there makes it a lot easier. Just, just putting out content and then you get to help people. 
uh, which feels good as well. And I think that's, you know, at the end of the day, that's, that's really what it's all about. So I almost feel like it's a necessity in today's age to yeah. use a lot of the technology that we just alluded to in order to, you know, help grow your business and that sort of thing. Otherwise, it's going to be much, much more challenging to compete. It's a whole you know? lot harder if you don't leverage it. It's a, I mean, it's probably arguably one of the most powerful tools in the world. It's at our disposal for free on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So why not use it? Yeah. And if you look at, you know, our parents' generation, they didn't have uh, the ability to go on social media or start a podcast and build out their personal brand. It's like, you know, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, the, the folks that had brands were, you know, celebra celebrities, movie stars, musicians, and you had to like actually go out there and really earn your your stripes. But today's age, it's like, dude, anyone can start a social media. Anyone can start a podcast. I always say, man, if you're in the space, like starting a podcast, one of the best things you could do. Man, I was, yeah, I was, I was listening to Pineda video downstairs mm -hmm. before I came up yeah. here and he was talking about how foolish it is not to have a podcast. And I was mm -hmm. like, you know, you're probably right. I probably should have. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, I mean, you, you sort of do with the big yeah, pocket yeah, stuff, yeah, right? Yes, so yes, you, yes. you get a good taste of, of what that's like and you're able to kind of uh, monetize that to a certain degree, but right. I also feel that like out of all the different platforms out there, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, I would say the podcast platform and the podcast audience is the most sophisticated, the most savvy, and uh, they tend to have the highest net worth as well out of all those different platforms. You know, it's hard to build someone's trust from a 30 second TikTok, but people go on and listen to your podcast. They start listening to hours and hours um, of conversations that you're having with, with people that are much smarter than myself. Um, and it starts to build a lot of trust. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I always say, I'm like, dude, you don't have to be an expert in order to start a podcast. Like you can just start interviewing people that are smarter <laughs> yeah, than you. Yes. And it's yes. like a couple of things happen, right? Like one, uh, you get to learn from those folks because yeah. you get to ask them all the questions that you genuinely have. And then two, you get to leverage that social capital. Yeah. So it's like, because you're interviewing a big name person, now people start to view you as the expert as well. Yep. And then you're providing value to the listeners, which is which is a good thing as well. Yeah, absolutely. That, I think that's the key uh, with a podcast is it's instant value you're adding to someone who is on a different level than you, mm -hmm. right? Like I, I said, I go to networking events. You look for ways to add value. Like that was my way to try to get close to people who were on a higher level than me. Yeah. If you have a podcast, you're, you've got an instant way to say, like, I, I'm bringing you value. Mm -hmm. And then if you help people, human nature kicks in. People naturally want to help you, man. It's just, it's, it's cheat code. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, and, and Pineda talks about this all the time. And it's like, you know, I agree. You got two types of people, right? You got uh, content creators that, you know, maybe they're not investing in real estate. Maybe they don't really have a, a real business and they make their money from affiliates. And, and that's cool too. Um, and they're good at putting out content and building the brand. Um, and then you got people that are entrepreneurs and real estate investors that are good at making money within their prospective business. They're good at buying real estate, but they're not putting out any content. Um, but I think the cheat code is, is someone that, you know, can be at on a scale of one to 10, maybe a level seven or eight in terms of real estate investing and business, but then also be a seven or eight in terms of putting out content and building the brand. And if you can do both of those at a decently high level, that's the, that's the fucking cheat code. Absolutely. You know? Um, makes it easier to source clients, to source investors, to get, you know, access to good quality deals, access to partnership opportunities. I mean, it just makes everything a lot easier. It sure and does. So, man. you know, it's 2024 it sure and I don't know. I mean, one of the things we do is like, we, we got the meetup, right? It's free. We meet a ton of really cool people through the meetup. Yeah. We got the podcast, we do social and it's like, you know, you set up systems and processes and you know, the stuff just happens. It's, it's not, once you get it down, it's just, it just becomes like a routine, you know? I tell my students, man, like if you want to get instant, if you want to build like instant trust and start to bring the people to you who you need for your team, like host a meetup. Yeah. Like it might be slow at first, but I mean, people see you when you host a meetup as an expert, whether you've done a deal or not, right? Mm -hmm. You're the person hosting the meetup. And so everybody that's coming there wants to meet you. And if you do it in a way where it adds value to people, and you get to be the beneficiary of all that. Oh, totally. Like, like you know, I tell my students, man, go, go host a meetup and do it at a title company. Mm. Title company will probably pay for food yeah, because they got a marketing budget. If you're going to tell a title company, I just want to have a, a meetup with a, with a few real estate investors, and then that's potential business for them. Every deal that closes in their office, they make money on, right? Mm -hmm. But if you now send out, you know, a, a, a newsletter that says, hey, I'm going to have a real estate meetup, at XYZ title company, you can now invite agents and they'll probably go because you're having it at a title company and not at Applebee's, right? And so it's like, there's a little more prestige to it because you're having it at a title company. 
So them as a professional might want to be there. Other investors might want to be there. Doesn't cost you anything to be able to do it. You build a network with your title company. You build a network with investor friendly agents. You build a network with lenders who you can get to go there. And all you did was just coordinate people showing up at the same place at the same time. Like, yeah. And to take a step further, I mean, you know, just to host a monthly meetup at the, you know, same day of the month, every single month, you know, not only is it the stuff that you alluded to, but, you know, to think about even the folks that don't show up to your meetup or they don't listen to your podcast, but they see, hey, Henry's putting out a new meetup every single month, same date. He's hosting this stuff, putting out a new podcast every single week. They see it. Even though they don't listen, they might not go to the meetup. They still see it and it builds trust. It, they start to view you as the expert and it makes them more comfortable maybe investing or becoming a client. And so, you know, there's a, even indirect like benefits that come out of it. And I'm like, dude, this is like one of the easiest ways for anyone to start to kind of build their, uh, their email list, to start to build their core of investors or whatever Absolutely. they're looking for within their business. And, and the meetup is great to, to build your email list. You know, everyone that comes out, yeah, we host a free meetup, come hang out. And, um, but you know, we collect everyone's email addresses when they come out. So we put them on a drip and so we can you know, notify them of future events. They want to know what's going on, but then it's like, Hey, a new podcast episode just dropped. Yeah, right. So, so smart, you man. know, you, you start your podcast and then there's your first set of like listeners as well. Absolutely. You know, that's a great idea. And, um, so I don't know, I, I, th I think there's a lot of different tools out there that you can utilize meet us podcast, social media to your advantage. It's not that hard to do in, in 2024, you know, it I think all, everyone it should all be takes doing it. hustle and work, man. Yeah. But once you set it up, like I said, it's like, it just, it just happens. And, you know, good team members, good systems, processes. Uh, I know before I had a team, I was, I was the one that was doing all the meetup stuff. I was the one posting the emails, putting all the stuff to market it, get people uh, doing the signing and all that. I was doing it, right? So I know what it takes. Uh, now, we, now we have a great team and it just happens, but um, it's, it's not rocket science, man. Yeah, but man. that's the stuff that, you know, if you want to be successful in the space, and you want to grow, uh, you want to give yourself the best potential and to, to be successful, those are the little things you got to do. Absolutely. You know, a a any other, um, I guess I'm curious for you, you know, you talk to a lot of real estate investors at these events. What do you think in your estimation separates uh, a successful real estate investor from, from someone who maybe gets in the space, gives up and, and never ends up doing it? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think the best way to say it is like, this business is hard. Mm. It's going to be hard. It's supposed to be hard, right? It's not supposed, if it was, if it was, if it was going to be easy, then that would make it hard because everybody would be out there doing it, becoming yeah. a millionaire, right? Like there's got to be something that weeds people out. You have to decide if you're going to be the person that gets weeded out or you're going to be the person that's going to push through that. Like it's supposed to be challenging. And if you don't understand that going into it, and tell yourself on the front side, like, I'm going to be successful no matter what. I'm going to do this no matter what. Every time I hear somebody failing at something, it's typically just because they quit. Like even in with my students, right? They'll say, I mean, I'm trying this marketing and it's not working. Well, how much of it are you doing? Mm -hmm. Are you funding it appropriately with the right amount of time or with the right amount of money? And are you doing it for a long enough period for it to work? Like that part's hard, right? Like if you're going to do something, you got to commit to it for a certain period of time. Like I was, I was having this conversation in my head outside. I was, you know, cause if I start a podcast, the only way I would start a podcast is if I'm going to commit to putting out at least one episode a week for 12 months, regardless of if I'm getting the views that I want, regardless of like, no matter what the metrics say, like I got to be able to do it consistently for a year before I make a decision of was that a good business decision for me? Like you have to be relentlessly consistent in your pursuit. And I think people who fail in real estate are just people who gave up because it was hard because mm. something kicked them in the teeth and they quit because they spent money on some strategy that didn't work or because they got all the way to the closing table and a deal fell apart. And it's like, we've all had those hard days as entrepreneurs, man. It makes you just feel like, why am I even doing this? Oh, but then, dude. But then we get up and do it the next day yeah. anyway, right? Like we, we get kicked in the mouth, punched in the face so much. And, and every time I like, break through to a new level and I unlock a new level. I'm like, fuck, it feels good. And then boom, next week I'm getting punched in the face again. Right. And I'm like, oh fuck. He was yeah. another it's like bottle. gut wrenching. Like, I don't think people understand. Like yeah. it's some, the, like it makes you feel like what this is, I, why am I putting myself through this? But yeah, you got to like, you know, like we all go through it and as you grow, it gets lonelier and lonelier. Right. Yeah. But I always, I always tell myself and I'm like, you know what? Like 
the sh when when the shit gets bad and you're dealing with shit that a lot of people don't understand and they're never going to understand or see that's why it's worth it to me because yeah. this is the shit that most people are not willing to do yeah. and that's why the reward's so high at the other end you know and i always say like things get overwhelming things get challenging before the level up yep absolutely are you going to give up before the level up because it's coming <laughs> yes. right yes. that's why things are getting overwhelming because yes. you're about to level up yes and so are you you're going to run it from it and give up or are you going to push through and problem solve and get creative and figure it out that's what 99 percent of people are not willing to do um that's why most people are not cut out to do this but if you can stick to it you can commit to it figure it out you will figure it out i mean when your back's up against the wall and you really want something in life like when have you not figured it out we always do and um, if you just stick to it, figure it out, you will level up and there will be a new level. And then you get to that next level. And <laughs> then you like, get to do it all over other, again. Yeah, there's a whole other <laughs> level. And yeah. it never stops, you know. Yeah. But, I mean, I don't know. For me, man, I didn't realize this until a couple of years ago. I'm 38 years old. But, like, I, I didn't realize until recently, like, what makes me happy is, is growth and progress. So, you know, the second I'm not continuing to level up and push through to new levels, the second I'm I'm... I'm dying. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I truly feel that, you know? Yep. Yeah. 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 Anyways, dude, I appreciate you coming on the pod, man. I'm excited to go over to the meetup and uh, connect with you further, dude. How can folks get in touch with you and learn more about your mentorship program? Yeah, man. The best way to get a hold of me is on Instagram. I'm at the Henry Washington on Instagram or check out my website. You can get there www.seeyouattheclosingtable.com. Oh, that's a good domain. S E E Y O U A T, theclosingtable.com. I love that. There it is. He's Henry Washington. I'm Rich Summers. Listeners, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you in the next one. Peace.